All right, welcome back, everybody. We are uh, in the middle of uh, getting to know yourself better than the devil. Um, this is part two. Uh, it's important that you spend some time listening to part one. Uh, and a very quick recap, uh, part one is based on the idea that um, in order to fully appreciate who you are, you have to be mindful that you are a soul, not just a body. That you have a God-given purpose in this world, that there is an infinite being that is madly in love with you and wants you to succeed in everything. But the world that he creates is a world of challenge, and often that challenge, no worries, we see that challenge as being frustrating and evil, but when we're able to uh, accept the challenge, when we're able to overcome the challenge, uh, that is where uh, our greatness comes from. So what I want to do today is I want this to be a bit more practical, because a lot of, of the first talk was uh, uh, philosophical, it was ideas, it was um, you know, just ideas to help you appreciate a process. Um, but to this, this class will require some effort on your part, not just listening, but actually what we call doing the exercises, doing the avodah. So there, this is a quote from the encyclopedia, encyclopedia.com. It's an uh, entry on Abraham, our patriarch, the first Jew. And he says as follows, Abraham is now regarded as one of the most influential people in all of history, right? The world's three largest monotheistic religions, in fact, possibly monotheism itself, found their beginnings with him. Over three billion people in the modern world cite Abraham as the father of their religion. How profound. What makes Abraham such a... Uh, important character figure. What is it that he invented and created? What was so unique about monotheism that so many people, that 50% of the planet's population, agrees with Abraham and his discovery of God? This one God. What makes Abraham so profound? So let's talk a little bit about his process. Abraham was born where? In Iraq. Okay, yes, he's Iraqi. What's that? That's right. He is Sephardi. All Jews started in middle, the Middle East. Okay. Um, and uh, what's that? From where? From Iraq? Where? From which city? Baghdad. Oh, Baghdad. Nice. My, my wife's family's from Baghdad. Yeah. Abudi. Oh, nice. Nice. So, yeah, I get to eat all the amazing Iraqi food. We get the hameen and we have all, get the. Uh, all the good stuff. So uh, we have the, uh, we have, he, he was born there, and he was born to a very wealthy family, uh, a very aristocratic family. Now, in the ancient world, civilization was broken down to two sections, what we call upper class and lower class, or what we call the patricians and the plebs. Okay, the patricians were the wealthy class. They lived on top of the mountains. That's why it's upper class. And the lower class people were the people that lived in the valley, the people that lived on the, on the, on the bottom of the mountain. Right? Different, that's where the, the, those division of classes came from. Abraham was born to a wealthy aristocratic family, very, very prominent family. Uh, most people are not aware of this, but he, yes, his father's name was Nimrod, and his mother's name was? Sorry, Terach. Nimrod was his foe. Sorry, Mechila. I don't know why the coffee today was not strong. Still not fully awake. So Terach was his father, and you know what Terach's wife's name was? Amtalia. Very good, Amtalia. Amtalia comes from the word Amtala, which means a logical argument. And the Midrashim tell us that she was very responsible for raising her son on her own. Why? She didn't divorce Terach, but Terach lived at a time where Nimrod the king, uh, who had a prophecy, just like Pharaoh did, that there's going to be a boy that's going to be born that's going to usurp your kingdom and your ideas and beliefs. So Nimrod makes a decree that every single male child has to be sent into the fire as a sacrifice to Molech, their god. Just the opposite, Pharaoh sent all the boys to the water to die, and Nimrod sends, high, sends all of the uh, boys into the fire to die as well. Uh, Amtalia says to, uh, Amtalia says to uh, Terach, I'm not doing it, you're crazy, I'm pregnant. According to the law, my son is gonna have to be, I'm not sending him on fire. I'm not doing it. She gives birth early, okay, just like Moshe was, born, born early. She takes him away from Iraq and goes into the desert and finds a cave where she raises him outside of the civilization that they were in part of. Okay, she educates him and she trains him. Now, when we read the Midrash that says Abraham comes back at a, at a, at a, at a later time in history, he's reintroduced his father and his father's business, we understand why he was led to this ridiculous, he, he, came, he arrives at this amazing conclusion that why would anyone want to worship an idol that was just built by man? 
right? Where did that come from? It wasn't just an epiphany he had. It's because he's coming from an outside world and being reintroduced to a society which he does not understand. He can't relate to it. So in this process of his mother educating him, his mother being the one that gives him the chinuch necessary to discover God, I'm not saying that she was a monotheist, but certainly she was someone who was uh, looking for truth. Someone who was not afraid of asking the hard questions. Someone who could question the rule of the king and willing to die for it. And this puts Avraham into a very interesting position. He's known as Avraham Ha Ivri. We know the word Ivri means on the other side, right? Ever Hadnar, on the other side of the river. He put himself into a place where he took on a philosophy that was completely opposite of everything that the world that he believed in, that the world that, 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 that at the time that believed in a polytheistic faith. Right, where every truth is true, and no one person can have any truth, and he takes himself into a philosophical position and disagrees with it. Think about that today. How many of you are willing to take on a political position that is tied to your uh, philosophical uh, core values and willing to stand on your own to preserve that core value and wave the banner of that core value? That's what Abraham did. He didn't care about what people would think. He didn't care what society would say of him. They made fun of him. They ridiculed him. They called him a barren mule. Okay, he's, don't worry about him, Nimrod said. I'm not worried about him. He's going to die. Him, he's going to die with no children and no, no beliefs, no one to take on his philosophy. He's just a blip on the radar. Don't worry about him. We don't care about him. Right? This is who Abraham was. Abraham was someone who is willing to stand literally on the other side of the planet alone. You take the whole of society and you have one guy who's literally standing there alone. That was Abraham. He stood by himself against the world's philosophy and belief at the time. Where did that courage come from? Where does that ability to stand on your own, irrespective of what everyone tells you you should be thinking of, you should be doing? I'll give you an example. I have a son who's in a school here in the city. And um, I'm not anti-vaxxing. If you want to get vaccinated because you're at risk, B'chav would get vaccinated. But a 10-year-old boy does not need to be vaccinated today, okay? But the school insists that every single kid has to still be vaccinated, right? And, um, and if he's not vaccinated, at the very least, he should get a letter from his uh, doctor that says he does not need to be vaccinated. Okay, so I did not have time to get this letter from the doctor. The doctor certainly said, not a problem, he definitely does not need to be vaccinated. I uh, have no problem writing the letter. We just, between our schedules, we haven't gotten it. So yesterday the school calls and said, yeah, we're taking your son out of school because he's not vaccinated. I'm like, what do you mean he's not vaccinated? I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm, he, they, took, they pulled this kid out of a classroom and made him sit on a bench in a hallway. Because, I, I, I'm gonna bring you a piece of paper that says he doesn't need it. Does it really matter that he doesn't have the paper right now? Like, what are you worried about? Like, what's the concern? So I called the school's health department, the nurse, and I said to her, you know, I don't understand. The CDC said that this is no longer guidance. Why are you still pursuing this? Oh, we no longer use the CDC guidance. We're a private school. We have our own guidance. And then, like six months ago, it was, oh, well, it's not our guidance. It's the CDC's guidance. Uh, this is the CD so like, it's, this, it's this ridiculous game, right? When society takes on positions that are ir illogical, where we are no longer thinking, we're no longer questioning, when that happens to us, which is exactly the society that Abraham lived in. A society of people who are no longer asking questions. Oh, we do this because everyone does this. It's okay to sacrifice a newborn baby to a fire god because that's what everyone is doing. Infanticide was the norm in the ancient world. Normal. You know how the Greeks did it? If the Greeks had a child that they did not want, which is either the firstborn female or a child with any kind of deformities, any kind of deformities, which means that if they thought the baby wasn't going to be pretty, the way in which they got rid of that child was after birth, they took it by its left leg and smashed it on a rock. Even saying that sentence makes me sick. But society accepted because that was the norm. Now, look at number three on your sheet. Exercise number one. Does our society condition us to its values? What does our society value more, entertainment or human dignity? Cite three proofs. Do this later on your own. I'm telling you, it'll make a difference. If you really want to get to know yourself, you have to understand the environment that you come from. Okay? What is, what's more important? Ready? Wisdom or wealth? I can't tell you how many times I ask this question to people that I learn with, and they say, wealth. Of course, Rabbi, wealth. I'm like, 
I'm like, are you crazy? Are you serious? Of course, because with wealth you could find wisdom. I'm like, like for wisdom. Right, because he understands that if you have wisdom, you could have wealth. If you have wealth, you'll lose. Without wisdom, you'll probably lose your wealth. Right? It doesn't make any sense that you have wealth, because most men think wealth is power. And they don't understand that real power is wisdom, not wealth. Right? So what does your society value more, entertainment or human dignity? You tell me. What is it? Is it entertainment or human dignity? What defines us? Well, our society today, I, w I would argue, values entertainment more than human dignity. Right? For ourselves, it should be human dignity, but our society says it's entertainment. Okay? Is exploitation of women justified to sell products? Yes. 100%. You walk on, I was, yeah, I was two days ago, I was in Times Square. Uh, sometimes I have to go there for different meetings, and you can't look up at the billboards, right? Every single woman should be upset when you see a woman who's wearing a bikini yeah, yeah. on a big billboard, right? Uh, it's 100 feet tall, because like, I, we need a... It, I'm just saying, like, I, I, it's, this is not a question of, of feminine and expression. Uh, I have no problem for a woman to so dress however you want to do it. But I have a problem when society says, well, we're going to use, you know, uh, you know images uh, that elicit all kinds of things. For example, Calvin Klein, every Calvin Klein ad is telling you two things. Ready? Number one, it's about to happen or it already did. That's every single Calvin Klein ad for you. Because what are they selling? They're selling this image of sexuality, right, that if you wear our stuff, this is where you will be. It's fake, it's false, but this is society, right? Does the value of pluralism, right? Does the value of pluralism, I am okay, you're okay, make it difficult for you to develop and assert clear values? If there are no truths, because everything is true, right? Which, which is, by the way, a value we've lost to this generation a little bit. We've lost pluralism. Today, there's no longer pluralism. You don't believe in anyone's value. There's only, if there's one value, right? A party value. If you don't fall into my party's values, you're the enemy of the state, right? That's where we're today. Is a girl in high school looked out upon for covering her body? And the answer is, unfortunately, this is true today. They get shamed for this, right? Will I be condemned or approved by others if I claim I know what I know to be absolutely true at the expense of someone else's truth? Well, look, at, look what happened at Yeshiva University this, this past week, right? So there was Yeshiva University was, at a, was uh, taken to court by a, uh, some students who wanted the, 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 the university to pay for the gay and lesbian club. They wanted to get a budget from the school. So Yeshiva University is like, no, you could have a club. You could do, you could do that. We're not going to stop you from doing that, but we're not paying for it. That's not aligned with our values as an Orthodox institution. So they took them to court. And uh, what's that? They happened to have won the case for now. Right, but it's not, it's not over. It's, it's going to go, it's for sure going to go to the super, why you won the case. And the case was, by the way, was being defended by a Christian group who uh, has, uh, I forget the name of the, uh, the, uh, that group, uh, they, they funded this because they realized that if, 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 if why you can't have its own governance, its own rules as a religious institution, then every religious institution is going to be uh, coming after. So they, 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 everyone band together to help Yeshiva University to make sure they don't come after the churches next. Right? But this is a world where, 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 where our own beliefs are being challenged today. You know, oh, you know, they're, they're fanatic. They're religious, you, you don't, it's, it's, you do what our society tells you to do today. Okay? And again, like, the, the gay and lesbian community, whatever, wherever they're at, you know, that's their, that's their problem. But don't go ahead and tell me that I need to support your values. I could respect you with your, with your bad choices. I could, under, I, could, I could think that you're making poor choices, right? I don't, have to, I don't have to support what you're doing. That's a whole other thing. So are you aware what values of your society are? Could it be that you have passively accepted some of them? How much of your personal values today are a reflection of the, value of, of, of the society that you're in today? Where do we draw the line between what we accept as being the norm from our environment versus what the norm is? This is true, by the way, in relationships. Most people today don't understand what relationship, relationships are about anymore because we've adopted a societal understanding of what relationship norms look like between men and women. And it's a mistake. It's a mistake. And therefore, all I'm saying is question it. Question everything. 
Question yourself. Why do you do the things that you do? How much of what you believe in, how much of your own core values are a reflection of your Jewish values or your societal values? Where do your values come from? If it's arbitrary and there are, my values will just shift and change based on the environment that I'm in, then, then there are no, that's not a core value. So what moral principles should be something that are eternal, not just something that changes with society. Yeah. Baruch atah me'ach olam shahakol ni'ah bevaro. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm, I, I am. I'm, I'm, I, listen, there is an evolution within Judaism. I'm not saying that things. Are, listen, Judaism today is not the same Judaism from 2,500 years ago, and you know, and uh, or 3,200 years ago, like when Moses came out from Sinai. Of course, it's different. You know, the way in which we practice kashrut in our societies. And there is an evolution, but at the core, right, the fact that we can even have a conversation about you know how we deal with inheritance, how we deal with women in society, and so on, that's. That's part of the process. I'm not saying that things have to stay the same. I'm saying that things definitely do evolve, but there is a process that we use to allow that evolution to take place. It's called halacha. That Rabbi Riskin isn't say, making a statement based on the way he feels. He's making a statement that's based on Jewish law. And if you're making statements that are based on the system itself, using the system to help it evolve, I'm okay with that. Because the, the, the law changes. There were, there were people, when electricity first came out, you know, in the early 1900s, there were rabbis that said you cannot use it on Shabbat. There were plenty of rabbis that said you cannot use it on Shabbat. Absolutely not. You cannot use electricity on Shabbat. But as times changed, right, there were plenty of rabbis that said you can. But we use a halakhic process to allow us to evolve and make the changes. The changes have to come from within, not from without. Society will get us to question why we do the things that we do, and that's okay. But as long as we're using our own values to interpret how we do what we do, as opposed to external values, then you're in a safe place. When it just becomes a thing of, well, this is what everyone around me is doing and therefore we need to change, that's a problem. That's, by the way, what happened with reform 150 years ago in Germany. Jews in Germany felt that, you know what, we just want to fit in with everybody else. So let's, let's, what, what's, the, what's the obstacle? You know what the obstacle is? This is true. You can Google this. The reform movement said 150 years ago that how could you be a good German citizen if you're always praying to go back to, to Israel? So let's remove the word Israel from our tefillot. Let's remove the word Jerusalem from our tefillot. We're not going out. We're staying in Europe. This is like 75 years before the Holocaust. Jews said we're staying in Germany. They took out Shema Israel. They took out anything to, go, to do with the land of Israel. They took it out. It's not, you could find Sidurim. They were printed 150 years ago. They have no mention of the word Israel because we're going to use external values to create our internal values, right? And this is destructive. This is super destructive. It was the most divisive. Like no, the reform movement, they became super Zionistic, although right now it's a problem. The new era of, of, of reform, the younger generation reform movement is having a hard time with Israel. They're struggling with Israel right now. Oh, are they imperialistic? Are they, are they, you know, they've bought into very much an anti-Zionistic uh, philosophy, uh, very pro-Palestinian. There are Hillels in the country that are pro-Palestinian, anti-Israel. It's crazy, right? But that's because you're allowing the outside world to define your values. When the outside world defines your values, you're in trouble. We use our inner, our inner world to define our values, and that's okay. And yes, and sometimes there are changes that happen as a result of it. I'm okay with that. I'm, I, 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 there's one thing that I want. I just want you to think, and I want you to challenge your society. So where does that strength come from? It comes from Abraham, who said, no, I'm going to reject what the society says. I, I, just, I completely, utterly reject the values of my society. He did not have, did not inherit a Mesorah, a tradition from Adam. He was separate. Noah, by the way, lived at the same time as Abraham. Abraham was 52 years old when Noah died. He could have gone to Noah, could have gone to Shem, could have gone to Chetacham and received a tradition from them, but he did not. His discoveries were on his own. He came to his own conclusions. That's what makes him so unique. 
That's why he is a father of monotheism, not Noah and his children. Right? So why should Abraham, Abraham's classification for truth, give him the strength to challenge authority? Why should this information transform him? Why does it? Why does it work like that? Why does a, accepting a truth give you the strength, the philosophical clarification of truth, give you the ability to stand up to things that are challenging and complicated? So this is what the, this is what the Midrash says, Rashi Rabbah. There was once a person traveling from place to place who saw a palace that was burning. He wondered, is it conceivable that this place has no one in charge of it? Thereupon, the owner of that palace appeared to him and said, I am the master of this palace. Similarly, because Avram, our father, won- wondered, right? He wandered. It is, he wondered, is it conceivable that this world has no one in charge of it? The Holy One, blessed be he, appeared to him and said, I am the master of this world. Okay, so for example, you uh, see a world that is filled with order, okay? The sun is 90 million miles away from planet Earth. Okay, it takes seven minutes for the rays of the sun to reach the Earth. Think about that for a second. When you see the light right now, right now, that's from seven minutes ago. Okay, the sun could be, you could put a cloak over it and block the sunrise. You won't know until seven minutes later that the sun's light was blocked. Okay, the sun's light hits the Earth and it, it ends up warming up the oceans. The oceans end up warming up and they turn to vapor. The vapor ends up rising up into the air. The earth is spinning, it's moving. Okay? The, it creates wind. The wind blows the vapor onto the uh, earth. The earth receives the rain that it needs, produces life. Okay? The world is working in tandem with each itself. It's a perfect system. Okay? It is working, they are working with one another. Every aspect of the world around you has been specifically, perfectly designed to enable you to live. Enable you to have the world that you live in right now. Everything you have right now is a gift of tremendous amount of little things that are in cooperation with one another. Think about that for a minute. They're all cooperating. The distance between the sun and the earth, the movement of the earth itself, the speed of the earth, the size of the earth, the, the water, the whole system, this massive biosphere that brings life is working in cooperation with one another. How does that happen? It doesn't make any sense. The second law of thermodynamics is entropy. So the world is in a constant state of chaos and disorder. Right? We spoke about this before. This room, I clean it right now, I come back a week, it's going to be dirty no matter what happens. The world is in a constant state of decay. Rust, things get old, they die, we, we, things move on. Like they, nothing lasts forever. Things are constantly being degraded. So how do we have a world with constant order and beauty and symmetry, constant cooperation? How does that happen? You think this is an accident? It's not an accident. Okay, we believe, like like Avraham did, you see a palace, you find order. You will never assume that the sands in the Sahara had a massive storm and built a palace. Chaos does not bring order. And we live in a universe of tremendous amount of chaos. And when you see order of this magnitude, like a solar system that is perfectly balanced to bring about life, you have to come to the conclusion of there being a designer. This is the conclusion that Avram comes up to. But he recognizes, look at the next source, okay? Jeremy Kagan, a book called The Jewish Self, which is an excellent book, not an easy read, but definitely very, a great book. Um, he says as follows, why does the Midrash compare the world to a burning castle? And why, why should its burning lead Avraham to the conviction that the world must have a master? Burning connotes destruction. Avraham looked around the world and saw that everything either dies or is destroyed. People grow old and die, and, 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 as do trees and animals, mountains and, and continents. Even stars eventually wear down or burn out. Nothing is permanent. He saw, on the one hand, his body aging towards death, and thought that that aspect of himself, which is, was accessible to Avram's senses, his body, was mortal. That which he knew in its essence, his self, was experienced as meaningful and, and infinite. He, uh, there's a duality, my body and my soul. One is finite, one is infinite. He concluded that if the only thing he knew in its essence was infinite, even though its physical manifestation was mortal, it must be that, though, the world which he could see was finite, there is something beyond it, infinite and forever. At that moment, Abraham discovered both himself and God. 
Thus, Midrash states that Abraham learned the Torah from himself, from his root awareness of self, which contradicted the culture and philosophy of his times. Abraham built his vision of the world from himself. Now, I want to add to that. Another way of understanding that is that because he saw the chaos in this order, he understood that the order was coming from something bigger than himself, something outside of the finite world. Because the world of the tangible is in chaos and disorder. There must be something that is bringing out about the order. The world is in a state of destruction, but there's something that is holding it back. There's something that pushes the, the oceans away from the shores, that doesn't allow the oceans to take over the, uh, the, uh, the land. There's something unique about the system that we have right now. There's something there. He saw something holding back the chaos as God. And more than that, it turned into an activist. Because if the world's natural state is destruction and there's something out there that is holding everything at bay, that holding the whole thing together, it must be that his responsibility is to do the same. It's not enough to not do bad. Just because you're not doing evil doesn't make you good. Just because you're not involved in doing something bad doesn't make you good. Most people, they, they think they're good because they're not doing bad. But to be good in Judaism means that you're proactively working on doing good. Abraham understood this. He was proactively doing good. What did he do? Well, he opened up the first bed and breakfast franchise in the Middle East, right? And, uh, and it was free. This is before Google, right? We're going to give things away for free, right? Abraham started this idea. I'm going to give away for free. Free bed and breakfast. All you got to do is come to class, so, right? It's like birthright. Right, this is where they got the model from. You come with me, spend some time with me, I give you a free trip, okay, and I, I get to teach you. And I get to help you rethink about the world that you're living in. Okay, Avram does this, and in a very short period of time, he has thousands of followers. Thousands of followers. That's right. And for sure, the, 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 the souls that he created in Haran, right? So he is a, uh, the verse states that he made souls. And the souls that we're referring to over there are the people that he educated and they became his students. Now, interestingly, all those students left once Abraham died and Isaac took over. He scared them away. He was too uh, scary for them, too religious for them, and did not have the open heart that Abraham did. And at that point, Isaac switches from a, uh, a goal of finding followers into building his family. And this is where the family of Israel comes from. But anyway, let's keep going. So it'll be Azriel Tauber, number seven. He says as follows. He says, God chose Abraham because he was the first one to realize the world was created for him. Bishvili nivraha olam. The world was created for him. Noah, Shem, and all the other sages and righteous people of the earlier generation uh, unanimously recognized the existence of the Creator. Everyone understood there was a God. They believed that he was the first and the only supreme being and the creator of all worlds, but they never thought that God's satisfaction in all his grand creation comes from this lowly man here in the physical world. God created the world because the world is beautiful, but not me. I'm like the, I'm the maggot. I'm the lowlife. But no, Abraham realized that you are the most important part of creation, that you are the special, most special thing that here, that God created the world for you. The ancients did not lack emunah in the creator, faith. What they lacked was emunah in themselves, who they are and what they can accomplish. This is the train of thought that led to the world's decline. <coughs> people took an attitude. What's that? Talking about the world, the people that lived, the, 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 uh, those that lived before Abraham, Noah and the generation before him, the ten generations between Adam and, and, and uh, Noah was before Abraham. Ten generations. It's complicated. It says it's called May Noah. It's called the waters of Noah, and that's a criticism of Noah. A criticism. Noah's criticized for not going out and doing outreach, right. for being somewhat of a, uh, of a hermit and uh, building up a, a, a boat for himself and not going out into the masses. Abraham would engage society. Noah stood outside of society, watched, watched. So in many ways, he's responsible for the waters. So he was a generation, he was a tzaddik in his generation, but that doesn't make him a, 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 a tzaddik uh, with a standard of, of a tzaddik. But that's a whole other thing. Anyway, fine. Correct. Even Noah did not have Jimunah in himself. Right? That's his point. 
He says, with the train of thought led to that, the world's decline. People took the attitude that it was improper for the lofty, almighty creator of the world to concern himself with humans, form the material substance who live in the lowly world. This, because if humanity gets themselves to a place which is so broken, sometimes the only way to fix it is by starting over. There is a point of no return. People, a person could get himself into a place of no return. It, they didn't have him, but they lacked it already. They, they lacked the Amuna. This is straight into the belief, thank you, that the Creator was uninvolved in what happens in, in our world, and He gave the world over the rule of the astrological influences of our stars and our planets. You will have your mazalot that define you. People began to think that man was incapable of changing anything, that he was controlled by the zodiac. Confusion increased until mankind became actually worshipping the stars and the planets. Abraham Avidu's situation made it almost impossible for him to choose the good. Born to a heathen Terach, he lived in a house full of idols, was raised in the, the class of idolatry. He had every reason in the world not to choose the good, but thanks to his profound insight, he discovered creation's awesome secret. The world was created for man. Man has free choice. He acts as an independent agent. Thus, he can rectify the world or, God forbid, ruin it. Abraham believed in the potential with all his heart. He believed that God is just waiting for the person who will come along to discover that man is the focus of creation. Abraham succeeded in his mission. He became the father of the central nation, and he will bring the world to its final rectification. Right? We're talking about recognizing that you, my friends, are special, and that you have a unique mission in this world that only you can accomplish and nobody else. Don't let anyone tell you that you're not special because you are made from stardust that you are an angel wearing clothes called a body, that you, have, you are so special, you can't begin to understand how unique you are. You're here in this world because you have a mission that only you could accomplish. God believes in you. That's why you're here. Do you believe in yourselves? Because if you don't, you're stuck. And what ends up happening when you're stuck is your environment defines you. And when you're stuck your environment begins to define you, right? The way in which you're able to break out of that is by searching for truth, is by looking for something bigger than the self, is by recognizing that you have infinite potential and it never, it never stops. There is no age where it stops. There's only the now. Now is your time. Two weeks away from Rosh Hashanah. What do you want to say? No. The environment never defines you. That's exactly what he said. Well, my zodiac, I was born at this time, my family, my community, wealth, education, ability. That, that influences you. It doesn't, def it doesn't define you. Your choices define you. Is there influence? 100%. We're influenced by our society. 100%. I am influenced. I, if I was living in Syria 200 years ago, I would definitely not be dressed like this. Okay? Uh, I would have a different accent, I would speak differently, I'd like different kinds of foods. There's no question that your environment has an impact, it influences, but it doesn't define you. What defines you are your choices. And if you don't have clarity as to where you're going, what ends up happening is that your environment will define you. And that's the problem, that's what he's saying. So now, exercise number two. If you, we look at the world the way Abraham did, what, what, what will we conclude? Observing nature and objects, from, uh, and objects form reveals its function. For example, the sun is designed to, uh, in an ideal way and positioned precisely in the universe so its rays can, at a distance of 90 million mile, miles from the earth, enabling life to exist here. Man was designed with the awareness to conceive that he, and even the sun, is a mere speck in the universe. Right? Why did God create a universe that's so vast? You know that with this, there's a new telescope that they put out called the James Webb Telescope. If you, haven't, if you haven't read about it, it's fascinating. Read about it. It's amazing. They have these beautiful octagonal shape, uh, 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 what's it called, mirrors that are made of gold. All right, and it was like an, it, it was a it was an, they 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 made this thing into like a transformer, like aerogami, where it was uh, it was packed very tightly into a rocket, and when it came to space, it unfolded its sails and had these beautiful mirrors that are able to capture things in infrared. We're seeing things in the universe that we never saw before. Okay, it's unbelievable, and the photos are crazy. When you see that, there's one picture you'll look at of, like, of the universe, the cosmos. You see like, a, like it's a, a tight picture of billions of stars. What you're looking at is only 7% of the known universe. Okay, we're talking about there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on planet Earth. 
Do you understand how big the universe is? Why did God do that? To make you feel small or to make you feel big? Big. You're important. You're so important. He creates this magnificent universe, so much space, so much out there, so much depth to the universe, so much color, so much beauty, so much opportunity. Right? You're stuck because you're allowing yourselves to be stuck. Your mind is stuck. It's your mindset. It's how you see yourself. Why is the sun and man himself designed with such precision? And anyone ever here ever have a kidney stone? I've had a kidney stone. So I lived in Israel. And um, I, you, know, you live in Israel. The water in Israel is filled with minerals. Okay? Um, so you know, you're drinking and drinking and drinking. And if you don't have enough citrus in your diet, you get clogged up. Calcium. If you've had a washing machine in Israel, washing machines in Israel tend to break within five to 10 years. In America, you have a washing machine for 30 years. At least it used to be that way, right? Yeah. But, uh, but you know, in Israel, everything breaks down very quickly, right? Israel is a harsh environment for Gashmiut, not an easy environment, not an easy environment for materialism, right? If you don't do a couple of washes every year on your pipes in Israel, you'll, you'll have that white like substance that blocks up your washing machine there. So you got to do a couple of cycles with just like lemon juice, okay? So uh, when you have one little, uh, tiny little stone calcifying in your body and it blocks up one small little duct, okay? I was in so much pain. I was, I was vomiting from the pain. I was like, I walk, when I walked into Shari Tzedek to like figure out what was going on, the, there was a long line. Can you imagine waiting on line with a kidney stone? The nurse saw me. I walked in, I was there for like 10 seconds. She's like, Boiti, come with me, <laughs> come with me. Give me this huge horse shot of a tranquilizer. I don't know what it was, but it worked very quickly. Um, and um, it was a lot of fun. And, um, and I had a kidney stone, I had a kidney stone. And I gave birth to a stone, right? And it was, it was this little tiny thing. But your body is perfect. Not an extra inch is there in your pipes for a little stone. It's perfect. It's precise. You gotta take care of it, right? You gotta make sure you take care of it. Make sure you have citrus in your diet, okay? So why did God create the world with such precision? Why? Why, what is the purpose of this design featuring a parent throughout nature? I, had a, I, was, a bio, I was a bio major, I was a pre-med student. Uh, my mom wasn't so happy when I became a rabbi, uh, but, uh, but she appreciates it now. And I had a professor that said to me, when you look at the anatomy of a rose, it almost makes you want to believe in God. She couldn't say it, but I saw God in the rose. You see what a little flower, to make a flower with the color, the beauty, so much there. You walk into a garden and you see all that, just stunning. It's there for you to enjoy. It's there for you. God made it for you so you can have gardens and feel a connection to nature, see the beauty in the sky when the sun sets. All the colors, doesn't have to be like that. It's not like that on every other planet. We're the only blue planet in our solar system. Look what it's like to be on Mars. It's all red and gray, right? You live in a planet with diversity and precision and beauty. He created it for you so you could be inspired, so you can go ahead and make choices that allow you to become a bigger, better version of yourself. This is the uh, Nativo Shalom. He says as follows, number nine, no two people have been created alike. From the time the world was created until now, no one can fulfill the mission of his friend, of his friend is intended to fulfill, right? This is something you should all paste on your wall. That is, each person has a mission and calling which he must achieve in this life. This includes a specific purpose that he came into this world to fulfill. God sets up each individual's life with the specific circumstances and conditions necessary to fulfill his purpose, to achieve his unique mission and calling. You are here with a very specific purpose, very specific task, and only you could accomplish it. Only you could overcome it. All the conditions of a person's life, whether physical or spiritual, good as well as bad, are granted to him in order to fulfill his unique purpose in this world. Only with these specific conditions can a person fulfill his calling. Without them, he would not be able to, he would not be able to do so. And since each person has his own specific purpose and calling, the conditions of each person's life differ from one another. One person has an easy life and another person has a more difficult life, dot, dot, dot. This is the meaning of lech lecha me'atzecha, go from your father's half in the land, your birthplace, your father's house, go for yourself, lech lecha. 
go towards your mission and the perfection of your soul. You have a unique mission. And I know it's hard to think about that because we always, we're always thinking about the things that we're missing. I'm lacking. Rabbi, it's not fair. If only I had this. Maybe if it was like that. Stop that. Stop being a baby. To be an adult means I accept my reality. This is my, what we call mitziyut. This is my reality. I embrace it wholly because I recognize that my station where I am right now is part of my mission. Lean into it. Wear it like a badge. This is who I am. I'm proud of it. Now, what are you going to do with it? Stay still, do nothing. Wasted opportunity. Wasted opportunity. Number, three, number 10, right? Finding a spark of Abraham within yourself. Did you ever stand up for something? If so, what value did you feel you were fighting for? Imagine for the moment that you had a personal trainer who helps you live each moment with its value. Would your life be different? How so? How would your life be different if you had someone there, a coach, standing behind you, behind you, telling you this moment is unique? How are you maximizing it? What would your day look like? What would you, what would you, what would you be doing? What would you attempt to do if you knew that you would not fail? What would you attempt to do if you knew that there was someone there helping you use every single moment in life to its fullest? What would, we, what would the world look like? Would it look like whatever it looks like right now? The answer is no. No, we would have figured out the cure for cancer years ago. God willing, soon. Akiva Tats, number 11. Okay. In order to begin the path of a genuine self-development, you must learn to reject the mode of today's culture, which sees the world as existing to serve the individual's self-interest. This is the problem. Today, most of us think that the world around us, it's, it's there for me, right? But it's only there for me, to serve me. No one, I spoke about this last night, no one here feels a, a level of indebtedness to the world that you're in. Do you feel a sense of obligation to give back because of all the good that you've received? Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. Most people, unfortunately, today do not feel that at all. Most people don't feel that. The younger generation today, they're like, what do you mean? I'm entitled. It's my right. No one thinks of obligations. I think of rights, what's coming to me, right? Sorry. Okay, so um, he says like this. He says, you must look beyond yourself. You must be able to see yourself as part of a greater context. If you cannot really give of yourself to anyone or anything else, you will forever be alone in your un undeveloped smallness. When you have begun to resolve the conflict of living as part of a greater reality, and yet in the greater expanded reality, discover your own individual uniqueness, you have begun to walk along the road that leads to a real maturity and real greatness. So there are two phases. First, strive to discover your uniqueness. If you don't have a clear understanding of who you are and where you want to go, you're going nowhere. What essential part of the world is yours to build? This question is critically important. What's yours? What are you going to walk away with? What are you going to do that? I'm going to ask the question, what do you want written on your tombstone? I had a student, his name was Alex. Um, he was one of the four people that I did not want to marry. Um, and I'm very, I, don't like, I don't like marrying people that I think are going to get divorced. Right? So, what's that? Uh, people that I think are going to get divorced. Right? And so, I, I, I told this couple, you're going to get divorced. Right? I don't think you should get married. And, and I, I, I rarely do it. There's, I've married uh, lots of people. I've married 219 couples. There's twice where I've told the couple, I don't think you should get married. Right? The other two that got divorced, I was very young. I had a feeling about it, but looking back, I should have said something, but I didn't. Okay? So, um, I said to Alex, I said, Alex, I'm like, you're, you're spending all your time at work. You're building your, your dental practice, right? Like, you have a wife. Like, she needs attention. Like, you know, you, you got to spend time with her. She's like, no, Rabbi, you don't understand. I'm a dentist. I'm like, what does that mean, you're a dentist? I'm like, your identity, your identity? He's like, yes. I identify as being a dentist. I'm like, okay, let's, let's talk about what that actually means practically. When you die, I said to him, what do you want written on your tombstone? He's like, Rabbi, you don't understand. He's like, my mother's a dentist. My grandfather's a dentist. My great-grandfather, they're all dentists in my family. So I'm like, what does that mean exactly? I'm like, do you want it to say in your tombstone, here lies Alex, this is the last cavity he will ever fill? Is that what you want? Like, what, do you, like, what, what does it mean to be a dentist? Because your profession 
does not define who you are. Your profession is a job. That's not what you are. You're a human being. You're a husband. You're a person in the community. Like you, there's things you got to do beyond being a dentist. Dentist, dentistry is nice. Fix people's teeth. Chavor. Do it. But that's not what you are. That is a profession that you use to be able to pay for figuring out who you want to be. But we spend so much time in our culture that my, my profession defines what I am. I'm a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, this and that. That's not what you are. Your profession is you. You're your profession. The book of you is your profession. Your power profession is your career. Your secondary profession is your career. You're here to do one thing and one thing alone, which is to clarify who you want to be and then execute it. The universities of this country, before the, in, uh, before the Industrial Revolution, talking about 150, 160 years now, if you, want to, when you went to Harvard and you wanted to get a degree in accounting, could you get it? No, you could not get it. They didn't have accounting degrees in, in Harvard 150 years ago. Did, if you wanted to be a lawyer, nope, you couldn't get that either. What about a doctor? Nope, no medical degree, no bio degree. Well, what, what did you go to Harvard for? Two degrees, ready? Theology and philosophy, that's it. Well, well, then how did you learn to become an accountant? How did you learn to become a doctor? You, called, you, 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 you found an apprentice. You found a doctor who apprenticed with somebody else. You had a misora. You had an apprentice. Well, if I was a doctor or a lawyer, why would I want to apprentice you? Oh, you spent four years in a higher level institution learning critical thinking and thinking deeply about what it means to be a better moral self? I'll train you. I'll prepare you. You could, be a, you could apprentice with me. First, you had people understood clearly, even in this country, they understood that the moral fiber of a person at the core, that matters more than their profession. But we flipped it around, too much time. We, first in, first out, we need, we need factory workers, just get them to school, teach them a profession, and that's what you become. Your whole life in, elementary, in high school is about, well, what's, what's, what are you gonna do? <laughs> There's so much more to life than your profession. This, this, is a, this is it. This is a, an example of where society corrupts a vision of what it means to be the best you. Right? So if you don't have, if, you don't, if you're not spending time to discover what your unique mission is, you're losing out on the best parts of who you are. You want to wake up in the morning and be inspired. If you don't have a mission you're, you're, you're working towards, if you don't have something that you're fighting for, you're not living yet. You're coasting. You're getting by. I don't want you to get by. I want you to live life. I want you to live a life of excellence. I want you to live a life of greatness. I want you to live a life of inspiration. But it doesn't happen unless you put in the effort and ask the hard questions, well, where am I going? What, what, what do I want my life to look like? And it's a question it's, that that's, that's we, we should always be asking, especially right before Rosh Hashanah. That's the question. Rosh Hashanah's question is, what do I want the year to look like? Do I want it to be the same? Repeat. Cut and pay, copy paste. That's what I want. I don't want that. I want to be more this year. I'm not, I'm not settling for less. But if you're not putting in the time to put in the effort in clarifying who you want to be, where you're going, you, my friends, are losing out. Okay. Second, develop the depth to see that the thrill of, of, uh, of fitting in, 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 in it, sorry, fitting in is as much more mature experience than the thrill of being a loner at any cost. We're too afraid of breaking away from our society. I'm too afraid of being different. I'd rather just fit in. I don't want to be the odd man out. I can't tell you how difficult it was for me when I decided I want to keep Shabbat, how hard it was for my friends to hear it. My friend, my parents is a separate thing. Like, I, I didn't even tell my parents. My friends knew first. I'm like, why aren't you coming out? What's going on? You know, my parents, I could hide it for a long time. For my friends, it couldn't hide anything. Not going out, not going to restaurants with us anymore, not going to fire now, what's going on? What's, what's wrong with you? Right? <clears throat> but it takes a lot of strength to be able to say, like, no, I'm not doing what you're doing. I want to be something different. Okay. So the immature personality will choose to step out of line. The immature personality will choose to step out of line in order to experience its own uniqueness. Immaturity cannot see the beauty in yielding the self in order to actualize the self. In truth, however, this is the only way to genuine selfhood. Okay. I, Please, I mean, this sheet is the most, if you don't have it, if you want a copy of it, email me. I'm happy to send you one because this is gold. This is a gold mine right here. This is a gold mine of information. This is a treasure trove. Like, you should be like, this is like gold. I'm giving you gold. This is huge. 
Okay, so uh, please reread all of this because these were heavy, very heavy statements. This is the last exercise, and if you can go back and do the exercises, they will. I promise you, you will have a different Rosh Hashanah if you spend some time working on this. It'll be different. I'll I, this is my last one here, but if you want it, I'm happy to. I'm happy to email it to you. It says like this: My career plan, college major, was a result of how many of the choices we made was a, a, a an inner sense of what I need to do know how to fulfill my purpose in this world, or, right? B, the, the, uh, the clarity of my gifts and strengths, which I need in order to fulfill my purpose, or C, the, what others told me I might like, or none of the above. <coughs> Why are you where you are right now? Right? Ask that question. Am I blank about what I value and refuse to value? Clear, not sure, in agreement with my peers, right? When I think about my unique role, am I... Do I look at uh, career opportunities that sound interesting? Do I listen to the advice of others? Do I examine my life experience and see what I will excel in? Or first, do I clarify why I'm here in the world or in general? Right? I have a clear sense of what is good for me, worth unique pursuing, and fantasy. Like, these are the questions you need to be asking yourselves. The first step of getting to know yourself better than the devil is having an action plan. The Yetzirah knows you. The Yetzirah understands that if I can get you to stop thinking, to stop asking questions, if I get you to think that you're not special, that you're just an accident of evolution from animals, there's nothing unique about you, then you're not gonna, not, I'm, just, I'm, 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 a, I'm a reflection of my environment. I'm an expression of the stars. I don't have choices. This is my family, it's my family's, my mom, my dad, my rabbi, my this, my that, all, the, everyone else is to blame for where you are, but not, you're not willing to take it upon yourself. I can't tell you how much power there is in knowing that you can control your matzav. You can control your situation. You're not stuck. It's an illusion. It's a farce. You have the power to do anything and go anywhere. But you've got to believe. That's the, you want to break out of the hold of the devil. We don't believe in the devil. And the Yetzirah. The, and the, the evil thought that holds you back from achieving greatness. Recognize, A, that you are special. That you have infinite potential. B, that you have a unique mission that only you could accomplish. And lastly, okay, lastly, that if you try, you will succeed. Right? Everything else is a lie. Believe. Have an amazing week, everybody. Thank you for listening.